Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Kill of the Week. I'm your host, Brandon, with my partner and wife, Jill. And today we are sitting here with Kevin Crook of Wicked Horror hey. Show. How you doing? Thanks for having me on. Thanks, thanks for being uh, being a part of it. And uh, thank you for always having us on your show, Wicked Horror Show, to promote anything jerks that we had coming up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's our pleasure. We always uh, we we like to support the uh, the, the little guys. You know, uh, that's where all the originality comes from. So, uh, we, you know, that's where you see all the cool stuff, in my opinion. But yeah, so anytime you know that anytime. Thank you very much. And, and us and the independent film uh, community are grateful to have people like you in our corner to help push independent cinema. Thanks. So why don't you uh, why don't you give a little bit of background of like who you are and what you do? OK, uh, yeah, my name is Kevin. I'm a big horror fan. Uh, I was uh, a music guy for a long time. Uh, I did. That was my main focus. And uh, then as time goes on and you get older and all your bandmates have kids you know you need to find something else to keep yourself busy and uh i love horror movies i love talking about horror movies and uh you know decided that i would start doing that and uh me and my cousin leo we started doing the dorkening and then it kind of split off and because we were doing the tuesday show would be more horror and then the, the sunday show would be more like just nerdy stuff so he took over the sunday show i took over the tuesday show and there you go and we have the Wicked Horror Show, and we've been doing this, I don't even know how many years. I haven't been keeping count. It's been a lot. Um, and we, we go live every Tuesday night, uh, most Tuesday nights at 9.30 p.m., where we have everyone from first-time filmmakers up to icons in my mind. Uh, you know, we've had Sid Haig on the show. We've had Dee Wallace on the show multiple times. Um, Kane Hodder's been on, uh, Sean Whalen. But at the same time, too, we have People that haven't haven't even made their first movie, they're they're going on to try to get funding, you know, stuff like that. And um, I think that's very important because that's the beginning of someone who may be the next icon. You know, you support them from from the beginning. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, seeing progression. You know, so uh, if we can jump in there, then even better. And um, besides that, I'm also part of multiple other podcasts, uh, Black and White Fright, which is just about classic horror. Uh, that strange show, which it's a lot of just horror news, stuff like that. Um, and uh, a new one that will be premiering in September called The Reeducation of Nancy Ann Ritter. Uh, so Nancy Ann Ritter was one of the bathroom girls in Scream. And she's over the last couple of years, she's been doing horror conventions, but she doesn't know anything about horror. So uh, myself and my friend Jeremy, uh, we are uh, teaching her about the people that she's rubbing elbows with and uh and about just horror stuff in general so we're uh we've recorded a handful of episodes and those are going to start uh being pushed at the beginning of september so that'll be that'll be fun so far so good um but yeah that's pretty much all i do i do that and i work hooray <laughs> oh always with the day job to pay the bills <laughs> oh yes oh <laughs> hopefully one day passion can uh, yeah, that would be nice. I'm I, I'm getting older and older. It needs to hurry up and figure it out. Because uh, I don't know if that's gonna happen, but we'll see. If there's a will, there's a way. Right. That's how I like to say it. Yep. Uh, cool. So we we invited you on this show. Uh, we asked you to pick a a kill from a movie that it didn't have to be horror, but a kill from a movie that really affected you, one that you really enjoyed, and things like that. So why don't you tell everybody the kill that you picked for us to watch and overanalyze. Yeah. <laughs> so this was uh this was actually a really tough decision for me. Um I was trying to figure something out that wasn't going to be like the typical what everyone picks kind of deal. And I was also trying to figure out one that, you know, one of them kept popping up in my head and I was just like, it's not technically a kill. It's it's a suicide. Um so it's it's a little it's different, but it's the uh from the omen. Uh, when uh, it's the first death in the movie, uh, this is all for you, Damien, and she hangs herself and crashes through the window, and uh, that that you know that definitely affected me. Um, the first few times that I saw it, for sure, it affected me quite a bit. How old were you when you first saw it? I don't know, because this movie came out when I was one. Uh, so, but I I think I was fairly young. Uh, my dad is a big horror guy as well. He got me into a lot of stuff. So it was a, uh, I, I was definitely too young to see it. 
Um, it was one of those situations where for the first handful of times that I tried to watch it, I couldn't make it past that scene because I just it was so jarring to me. I'm like, oh, my God, like if this is the beginning of the movie, what's going to what's what's coming next? You know, like that kind of thing. Yeah. Luckily, you know, it, it's it's not really that crazy. But as a kid, that's something that sticks with you. You know, there's there's definitely a few scenes out there that I'm like, no matter what, this is going to be terrifying in my eyes, even though. But like the effects maybe don't hold up anymore. It's still like certain scenes will stick with you if they, if it if you know it affected you early enough in your mind. They look different, you know. Oh, for sure. I mean, we we watched it fairly recently before uh, jumping on the call, and for one, both both of us haven't seen it since what college? Probably oh, it's been a while, and completely forgetting how early in the movie that the kill was. Yeah, and. Like it, it's easy to affect, especially for a child. If you're seeing it like when you're younger, like I don't remember the first time I've seen it. And uh, but it's at a birthday party. It's at a child's birthday party. Yeah. So like that right there to a kid is starts like it's my special day. Yay. And, yeah. you know, she's right. It's all for me. It's my birthday party. And oh, you're you're dead now. Yeah. Yeah. And all the kids are like freaking out. And it's uh yeah. So like the the father is like this politician and. He's got he's well to do and they're talking about him eventually running for president, all this other stuff. And it's it's. uh, Yeah, they're over in the UK and he's there. I, I don't even remember what his job is, but um, but he's over in the UK and the kid, he's like he's adopted. And um, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, there's a, bits of the story I didn't remember. So I'm glad I watched it again, too. Um, But uh, yeah, there's there's a lot. There's things that. I actually, I think still affected me like that. I didn't remember was from this movie, like the fear of Rottweilers, like mm-hmm. as a kid as well, because they're, they're scary dogs. And, you know, they, at least they were, uh, I they, love, I love dogs in general, but yeah, any giant headed dog is like approaching you can be a little scary, especially as a child. Yeah, especially one that's like staring at you like eye to yeah. eye. Yeah. yeah the dogs don't even do anything but you're like nope that's scary that's not yeah. okay the dog is yeah, staring yeah. at me i don't like it yep every every pit bull i've ever met has been the sweetest dog ever but that first interaction i'm like is this the dog gonna like eat my face like it's yeah. it's a possibility or tell yeah. me to jump out of a window what is it yeah. where are we gonna get at <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah it's uh it's but at the same time too you know they're they're, they're great and it's just a stigma that uh is planted in your brain and movies like this help that stigma. Movies like Cujo. Oh, yeah. A, a line that always stuck out to me from, this is going to go far left, but like talking about dogs. Uh, if anyone remembers the movie Corky Romano with Chris Kattan, there, mm-hmm. there's a, it's a terrible comedy from the early 2000s, but there's a part where he goes like undercover for his mob boss dad, who's Peter Falk, to like get rid of evidence against him. And he gets like abducted by these drug dealers and he's like bound to this chair and there's these like attack dogs. And his day job is he's a veterinarian. And he loves animals. Meanwhile, his whole family is associated with the mob and he didn't choose that path. And they have these like Dobermans that are like barking at him. And he always said this line that stuck in my head and like thinking about it with this movie. It was like, you know, bad dogs aren't born, they're made. And meanwhile, this Doberman's about to rip his face off. <laughs> And yeah. that's what I was thinking about with this fucking Rottweiler staring at this lady. Like, yeah, you know, well, you're, yeah. you're yeah. a hound from hell. Oh, totally. Yeah. And then even growing up, like, uh, you know, my friend, Matt, one of his best friends, like I met the kid a couple of times, was named Damien. And whenever my dad's like, oh, his, his friend's named Damien, you know what that means? And I'm like, uh, you're not helping anything like, uh, but so things like that. And then you would see a Rottweiler. My, my dad is a is a is a jokester as well so he would like always nudge me along kind of deal he's great um but yeah it, it uh it really it stuck with me and like it like i said there was a couple other ones that popped up in my head but i kept going back to that one and it uh yeah i think that may have been that and like like stuff from poltergeist i think stuck with me first you know those were the earliest for me and uh you know, the, the one thing from Poltergeist is the guy peeling his face. And it's just like, as a kid, that looks so good. Now it's a, it's basically a Muppet covered in meat. And it's just like, it's 
<laughs> it's not very good. It's, you know, it doesn't look good, but it, I still love the movie. Um, but as a kid, I was like, oh my God, that's crazy. There's maggots and everything. This is crazy. And it's funny it's- that you bring up Poltergeist too, because, uh, you know, when, when we were rewatching it and we're watching the casting and everything come up in the credits, and I was like, oh, holy shit, like this movie's directed by Richard Donner, who did Goonies. And then the music was uh, done by Jerry Goldsmith, who did Gremlins. And then meanwhile, you have this like kind of Spielbergian crew that all latched together to make this movie in the 70s to go on to work with Spielberg later. And, you know, with Spielberg, you know, shadow directing Poltergeist. And that was an Amblin picture. It's just funny how you brought up Poltergeist with that. Yeah. Too, all connected. And, and it's weird. I, I, I still I know everyone's theory, but. In my mind, I because Texas Chainsaw is my favorite. I, I'm I'm giving credit to Toby Hooper. I don't care. I'm gonna do it. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's, I, I have to. I have to just because I'm like, all right. Well, he he he's responsible for two of my favorite horror movies. Well, Spielberg That's- said he directed it. So if Spielberg said that Toby Hooper directed Poltergeist, then Toby Hooper directed Poltergeist. Right. Don't That's- get me wrong. I'm sure he was just like do this like whispering right in his ear he's like know what i would do is do exactly this then he would come in and he would show up with a toby hooper mask on and be like hey everyone it's me toby i'm here to work that's why it was spielberg's hands pulling the meat puppet (laughs) yeah yeah that's why he's like i I get to do that i have to do that scene and he was like early morning he's just setting up chairs like a a big jenga thing of chairs in the the kitchen um (laughs) yeah that's uh that's a great movie i love it and uh, uh, it's, it, it, I, I'm just like, I, now I'm thinking of the remake and I'm just like, eh, it's one of those things where they just need to leave things alone. But, you know, both both remakes, Poltergeist and the Omen remake, even the Omen remake was like, I get what you were going for. It came out June 6, 2006. And like, I, I get the idea, but just stop. Yeah. I haven't actually watched the remake. I don't know if I want to. No. Like it, I have it, but I, I cause I, um, got a super good deal on like a box set of like all of the all but like i think three like i think like number three is not in there i think there's like one two four and then the remake for some reason i've only know. ever seen the first one and the remake oh really yeah i didn't see any of the sequels did you i don't remember to be honest yeah that's that's the thing is they're not very they're memorable not, they're like, not memorable like, like, i've probably yeah, watched it i don't remember there were things I've definitely had had on in the background, and I don't remember anything about them. Yeah, just know yeah, that, that after I got the, them, they were there. Yeah. yeah, we did that with Children of the Corn. We tried to watch all oh of them, God. and it just got worse. But Children it, of the Corn, they just kept getting worse, and we're like, "All right, well, we saw yeah. that. That's done. We don't have to watch yeah. that again." Yeah, it for all- as much as I love Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I say the same about that franchise. Yeah. Like, oh, a geez. lot of them. We just don't need to talk about them. Like, yeah, they're probably yeah. something like here. In, in, I have a lot of people, I know a lot of people that that think two is a superior movie to one. And I'm like, you just love like over the top slashers. That's all you like. How yeah. about something that feels real? That's that's why I love the first one so much, just because it's mm-hmm. gritty and it feels real. Oh, yeah. And that's actually a, a, one of the movies we did with Nancy Ann Ritter. And she's just like, you've scarred me for life. <laughs> and she's like, she was like, it was so violent. And so I'm like, how much blood did you see? She's like, She's like, she, she, and then she realized she's like, like oh my God. She's like, there's only one know, bit like, yeah, right? exactly. it's, with, it's with the hook, right? Yeah. Isn't that like the only they, blood? They don't really, there? they don't really show any blood there. They, there's only one person who gets killed with a chainsaw in that movie, and it's Franklin. Yeah. Was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I, I think there's like, you see her, you see, um, uh, Sally like covered in blood but yeah. you don't really see how she got that way like she was going through like the the vines and stuff and getting cut up that way but there was a uh, yeah it's i don't know it's an interesting movie and i i highly recommend the uh gunner hansen book uh was it chainsaw confidential i highly recommend it there's a lot of really cool behind the scenes stories in that nice um, I'll sure. you're a reader i read that on vacation once and i as i was halfway through it i i got a text someone saying i'm sorry man and I'm like, for what? And then they sent me the message that Gunner had passed away. Uh, yes. like, what? Like, what the F? And it was like, I don't know. He was a good dude. Have you ever, did you guys ever get a chance to meet him? No, I never got to meet Gunner. He was a good dude. 
It was very nice, very like gentle and quiet. But enough about that. Let's talk about the omen. I'm sorry, yeah. I, just, I get very <laughs> sidetracked. I apologize. No, and that's, no fine. that's fine. That's the beauty of the conversations that we oh, talk. Totally. But uh, speaking of behind the scenes, I'm going to rope it back around to some behind the scenes stuff. Uh, some of the crew that worked on this movie had a very small um, effects crew. I think it was an effects crew of about like four people. You had, uh, you had, let's see here, John Richardson, Joe Fitt, George Gibbs, and Liz Moore. Those were really the only special effects people that we had on here. And um, with us doing a little bit of research about it and with the ominous effect of, of the omen being cursed, everyone said it is one of the most like notoriously cursed films ever. Right after they were done shooting this movie, John Richardson and uh, they didn't credit the assistant, but he said him and him and his assistant went right after this movie to start working on a film called A Bridge Too Far. And mm-hmm. one of their nights after they were done uh, shooting, they were on their way back to their hotel and the car was hit by a truck like that same night. And it, it didn't kill John, but it did kill the assistant in, in that in that matter, oh, which, is, which is unfortunate just to kind of add on to the whole spooky eeriness of, of the omen and things like that. But it seems like uh, with with how this kill was done or suicide, rather not really kill, but death was done. Um, it seems like the the effects crew might have had just a, a lighter load, let's say, out of all the kills in this movie, all the deaths in this movie, because Damien technically never kills anyone. Right. He, he's just kind of there and it all happens by accident. Yep. But uh, this might have been like the easiest in terms of just throwing a weighted dummy off of a off of an edge and. It was weighted down so much that it reverted back and crashed directly through the window behind him. And I think that for me was the most effective part of yeah. this kill or death rather is like, OK, yeah, she hung herself and and that. But no, that the weight of the body coming back and smashing that window, yeah. I think, is what really swinging back through it. So everyone oh. could see her body again. Yeah. All the kids could be like, oh, there she is again. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's actually the moment before you see her when you keep hearing her call his name and you hear this voice, but you don't know where it's coming from and you're looking around and you're watching everyone. You're like, okay, it's clearly not the mom talking. We see her. We see all these faces. Like, where is it coming? Like, that anticipation leading up to it. Because it is such a quick moment, but that you just hear her off in the distance and just keeps calling for him and you're just like looking around like, who the hell is calling the kid? And there she is, ready to, you know, roped up and ready and I actually like we were talking about you know like the blood and all like there's no blood she just drops it's yeah. not bloody it's not morbid and it really isn't morbid. a it's lot of blood in this movie really yeah. like the beheading I guess is probably the most blood you see and it's there's not a lot of blood there either yeah. you know and I think it also like goes to show like the the power of this nanny that she is able to get the attention of a full blown birthday party with merry go rounds tons of kids. And tons of noise, and you just tons hear of noise, her. and you just hear, and you hear her. her going, hey, yeah, real quiet. I'm like, you're not even like screaming it, you're just like gently saying his name. And I mean, and everyone just stops. He's like, someone stops a record, like, yeah, yeah. And everyone's just like, it's clearly up there, but yeah, oh, that I mean, like, it's like all of it leading up to it. I mean, like, she's very like motherly towards him and taking care of him. Mm-hmm. The mother's jealous. You almost would expect the mother to kill the nanny because she's starting to get jealous of their relationship building. and there she is just with her rope, like five minutes into the movie, ready to go. That's like yeah. props on props on like the you know, the film editors and the storytellers to establish that mood That's so right. quickly yeah. that you can see that tension, you can see the the love that she has for Damien that quickly. Mm-hmm. Cause you see her what 30 seconds prior to the hanging, because it's she hands the kid over, blocks eyes with the Doberman or the or the Rottweiler. Rottweiler. And then next thing you know, she's with a noose around her neck. Yeah. Like yeah. I mean, yeah, they were they were able to to really it, it, like it was such a uh, like a nice feeling movie up until that point. And mm-hmm. it just really takes a quick turn. And I yeah. think that's what was so jarring for me as a kid, you know. Especially because like you kind of forget that the kid wasn't theirs in the beginning. Like mm-hmm. you you forget really fast that like oh, your kid died and then this kid's mom died. So let's let's make everyone happy and you just adopt this one. Even even while rewatching it, I, I 
it, something that would completely slip my mind. And then it was brought up again in the movie. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, they, you know? yeah, we had to rewind talk, it yeah, we because we like her. missed it for a second. And we like, both like went to eat something and we're like, wait a minute, what's wrong with the baby? Like, why is the priest like over the baby? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's not theirs. Right. Yeah. And then it, again, like I think they were digging up graves or something. And he's just like, I need to find out who the parents are or whatever. And I'm like, like, I'm like, that's right. I keep forgetting. <laughs> like, because there's there isn't even that many kills in the movie, really. Right. But they're the kills that happen are just really cool. You know, yeah. like the the priest and the beheading and like a lot of the other stuff is just tension. You know, it's just building tension and like, I don't know. Yeah, but you just have this demonic little child just smiling and thrilled. Yeah. I think it actually would have been more disturbing. I know that they dyed his hair. They thought dark hair would be more demonic. I think a little blonde haired boy would be scarier. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, just think Children of the Corn, is right? They're all blonde kids. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I wonder what that conversation was when they're like, no. Brunettes are demonic, not blondes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've learned later on that, you know, like redheads are also demonic dolls too. So, I mean, That's I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. Children, I think children are just scary in general. Children are just terrifying. So, I, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. In, in, in horror movies, like, yeah, if you get a, a good, like, child actor in a horror movie, like, that, it, it's terrifying because it's like almost like, like, what are you really going to do? Like, it's a kid. Oh, yeah. You know, that's why, like, I love when movies will take like a risk and like do something that you just don't, don't see. It's a lot of foreign movies will do that. Like, um, there's a movie called Terrified. Um, it's on Shutter, but there's like legit for a majority of the movie. There's a little, there's like a kid, a dead kid sitting at a table who's just like rotting throughout the movie. Oh, nice! <laughs> and like Del Toro, uh, Guillermo Del Toro was supposed to like remake it or like produce a, a an American remake, and I'm like, they shouldn't. The movie's amazing, but they shouldn't because that's one of the creepiest part of this movie is not going to be in it. They're not going to do that in an American movie. No. If they want to release it in a theater, they're not going to do that. I don't know. I feel like the I feel like the limits have been pushed. I, I feel like we're we're inching further and further because the world is becoming so desensitized. Because like, mm -hmm. like even even in this movie, like some of the things that were seen as like crazy ridiculous like, like the impaling or like the beheading and things like that or the or even the baboons like those things that are meant to be so scary like the animals and stuff i feel like what was scary and what did this come out 90 or 70 76. 76 yep and so like what was like terrifying then and being so exposed to it it's just been desensitized desensitized and now it's like pushing the limits of what people can do so i think uh, i think a kid like a rotting body at a table will be fine because they kind of did it in dead silence, the James Wan flick yeah. where they had the dead yeah. puppet boy. That was it. Yeah. We didn't see him till the end. That no, was like the perfect it, doll or whatever. It, it was a very quick yeah. glimpse, but it was a rotted puppet boy. Yeah, like there's like close ups of this kid's face, like in, in terror. Like it, it's a, I recommend it if you haven't seen it. Like I, I watched it and I was like, I'm going to buy this movie right now. And like, I found a physical copy of it and I'm like, all right, it's going on the shelf. Cause I, I liked it that much. I was like, I can watch this whenever I want. Cause it's on shutter, but I want a physical copy because I love it. So, oh, uh, yeah. yeah, so it's good. I recommend it if you have shutter. Um, but, uh, yeah, sure I don't know. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's tough. There's you, you get some movies that really push it and no one complains and you get something that's like very nothing and people flip out. People just need to make up their mind what they're going to be offended by. Um, I don't know. Because, I mean, I love the fact that Terrifier 2 did so well in their, their very limited run, broke records and, you know, set a precedence for independent filmmakers. You know, like, they, they, you know, they can make original stuff that's going to sell and, you know, push big movies out of the number one slot for that weekend, you know, and uh you know, and there's a lot of insanity in that movie. There's a lot of crazy, like very violent scenes in that movie. But there's been other movies that, you know, are half as violent as that, that people like get upset about. Oh, I yeah. Don't get it. I don't get it. Well, because I think I think in, in terms of like Terrifier specifically, they set a predecessor to, to where art was fun. Like mm -hmm. art had a personality, which is which was like the same thing with like freddy krueger in the 80s he had a personality yeah that's true so, yeah because like, 
that there was some stuff in some of the Nightmare on Elm Street movies that are definitely pretty pretty insane. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. And those were older. But. It's that same char- it's that same characteristic is like you give them a personality versus like a blank canvas. And it's like, oh, this one's cracking jokes or I can laugh at this one. You know, not like Damien, who had as enough personality as as like a wet paper bag when everything yeah. was just dying around him. Yeah. You know, which uh, which probably also affected to why that was so scary in the 70s, too. You had this kid who didn't kid. have much emotion kid. besides he had yeah. pure terror. You're watching him be scared of what's going on around him because he had no, like, choice with it. I think the yeah. only one he had a choice with was what the mom when he pushed her over the banister, kind of thing. Yeah. That was I like, like I like the look of that, by the way. I like how they did it. Like how I mean, obviously it was just set up like when she was closer to the ground and she like turned. But I yeah. just like how they did it. I, I thought it was cool. I'm like, I'm sure that that doesn't look like it was that hard to do. I'm like, I'm sure it was not super easy, but I'm like, that was effective. You know? Yeah, I couldn't find too much on like how the effects crew did a lot of that stuff because it was like, like obviously with the weighted dummy, we assume the weighted dummy for the yeah. for the hanging scene that we're talking about now, and like with that one, they probably had her on some form of rig to like turn her around because they they did slow it down significantly. So mm-hmm. I can imagine that they really took their time to like flip her safely and properly. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, I thought it was effective and good. But you, you were bringing up like, like at the time and and stuff like that, like how people were taking things with with that black and white fright uh, podcast I do. We're watching movies from like the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, and so same deal. We're like, if we were watching this as a kid now, we'd be like, this is nothing, you know. But like, we have to think about like they're in a time where they just got like automobiles. Or something like this is like, imagine this being like, like, great. Like, this is just a big stop motion gorilla climbing up a building. Yeah. But they've never seen anything like this before. Yeah. Like, imagine, like, like the first time we saw Jurassic Park, like how real everything looked, oh, you right. know, and years down the road, it doesn't look as real, but it looks good. I mean, it still looks good. I don't, you know, so it's like we have to kind of get in that mindset and be like, I can just imagine, you know, and luckily my, my dad's still around. He's in his, he's in his eighties, but, um, he got to go to a lot of those kind of movies in the theater. Like he got to go to the movies where, um, I forget the dude's name. I, I think maybe something castle or whatever, where they would uh, have William like, castle. Yeah. They would have ghosts flying down the, whatever, like shocking yeah. chairs. He got to go, go to those in the theater. And, oh, um, so you know, oh, we talk, talk about it all the time. I'm like, Hey, we're doing this movie. He's like, Oh, I remember I saw that at, uh, you know, whatever, blah, 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 you know? Things and like Angler and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah it, it, it is it is tough, but uh, you got to really kind of put yourself in that mindset. Thinking back in that mindset of the time period and, and effectiveness there. Yeah. Like, you know, there's been numerous hangings yeah, across films, like, throughout the decade. And this one in particular being so early on and still being so effective even to this day. I think if I were to have seen it, if I would have seen it in the seventies and seen that on the big screen, I think I probably would have ran out of the theater mm-hmm. with something like that and be like, cause you've never seen anything like that, especially not at, not at that time frame. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, they referenced the movie a lot, like in, I guess, pop culture, you know, cause I, I, I remember watching like, really early like i used to i love snl so i'd watch like old re- like reruns from the first couple seasons and they would mention like damien and stuff like that like they would they would mention the omen um and i was like wow it, it really had that much of an effect you know that's that's pretty cool i mean and i guess that was all until the exorcist came out and then everyone forgot about the omen right yeah yeah pretty much yeah. pretty much yep <laughs> yeah, right reagan yeah. kind of took over well, I yep. think he was just louder and more intense. And I think Damien was totally. just a quiet little creepy boy smiling at everything. And that's to oh, yeah. me, it's much scarier. Because I think especially with the kill that we're talking about, like, it's not graphic. It's not It's not like bloody graphic. It's so quick. It's so almost innocent with how she's lovingly looking at him. And it's just so dark about it that it's just, that's scarier to me. Like, I think like at this point, we've kind of been desensitized to how much blood can be shoved in a screen and, and how scary mm-hmm. that could be. And that something like this where it could just happen that quickly where she's holding him. And then two seconds later, she's, she's up there ready with a rope. 
was yeah. we didn't have we didn't have to see the buildup. We didn't have to see her tying the rope. We didn't have to see her climbing out the window. You just see her there and just how scary that is. Oh, yeah. And I think they really yeah. let you just like the anticipation of like, like I said before, like just hearing her voice, but not knowing where it's coming from. And all of the children are just staring up at them. We're like, oh, well, they're scarred for life. That's yeah. great. And, you oh, know, totally. like, totally. it's just like I mean, we've talked before about making like shorts of like all the uh what are we going to do with like all the, the final girls, like them in a therapy session? Oh, yeah. Uh, like, I, I had this you know, idea therapy. of um, horror therapy and the show would be final girls from franchises talking to a therapist about and explaining all the shit they went but, through. So, with, like, what they went through. Yeah. So like, I also imagine like those kids being there like, well, I was there was a clown and he was weird <laughs> and then there's a girl hanging and that's weird. And everyone hates yeah. my name. Yeah. It's like thinking like one of the other things that this movie had an effect on was the name Damien. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's really associated with demonic child. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I was actually trying to research because like it's it said that I was doing research about the movie and like he was named after um what what was it? It was like he was named after like a priest, uh like a saint father. that like a father, father Damien. Damien. And I was like, okay, Father Damien had to have been demonic, right? Like you had to have picked some kind of like horrible name but all i can find is really nice things about this guy father damien that died of leprosy and helped people in the wine islands and was trying to help them through their mm. you know they're dealing with leprosy so i'm like so how did you pick this really nice guy to now yeah. name after a demonic child like i feel like i haven't found something in the story yet uh yeah even I, even like when you know they were going to church and um you know the new nanny or whatever was just like oh no we're just gonna go to the park whatever and then they mentioned it was like an Episcopalian church. Like I, I was like, grew up Episcopalian and like, like the, one of the like jokes that everyone used to say was like, uh, it's like Catholic light, like Catholic with half the guilt. Cause it's like, it's, it's a pretty like chill religion. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not a part of it anymore, but it's like, it's not as like strict and stuff like that as, as a lot of the other religions. So I was like, He's he's reacting like that to like an Episcopalian church. I'm like, wow, this kid's really messed up. Like, you know, but it, it, so even that, like I didn't as a kid, I wouldn't really know that. Like I wouldn't really because I didn't really know because I was just a kid who thought every church was the same when I was a little kid, you know, but even that, like, I wonder if that was even something that played with people that knew about religion, you know, but maybe, yeah, like one of those like weird undercuts, you know, like. Yeah, subtlety, especially with him being named after Father Damien. Like when we we're researching, uh, the writer David Seltzer named him was going to name him uh, Domlin after like a childhood friend who was like it was a it was a friend's child that was oh, like this like friend's child it was like a brat child that he's like oh well I just need like a little asshole kid like that kid's a little asshole and I was like that's not. <laughs> His wife said it wasn't nice. Yeah. I like, that's totally something we would do. It's just be like, I need what kind of what kind of child is an asshole? This one. Yep. That yeah. one right in front of me. And uh I love the good it. thing is, is that you know, you don't I've never heard of anyone with that name, so it's not like it would affect anyone. Yeah. What was it? Domlin? Domlin. Oh, Domlin, yeah. yeah. It would have affected one guy <laughs> that yeah. <got> it. Yeah. <laughs> when and he was known David and be like, Man, you suck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> something very common, like Jeff. Oh my God. Jeff, demon Jeff. Oof, it just sounds. Still, I still want to see him as a little blonde, creepy child. Oh, you know, like, you know, your own version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, he would look like in the the second Adams Family movie when the kid went from like goth to yeah, well, to they, light, they, and they, they give that well, curly blonde they, they hair. They reference that they had to straighten his hair and dye it, so I do wonder if he was like blonde and curly. Oh, dude, but I mean, like, a... he was the only child that that acted up during the auditions, like doing what he was told was to actually attack and do what yeah. he was asked to do so it's just i just i love the idea of like auditioning children and like the type of parent that especially at this moment in time was like yeah i want my child to be the antichrist like sign me up <laughs> yeah it depends on the people like if, if we had a kid like absolutely let, let's jump right in line but imagining those parents and what they must have been like and then to allow your child to be seen as the antichrist and then also dye their hair and do all these different things and it just makes me laugh like yeah, what they did to their kid, but yeah, this is totally fine. And I'm then, sure the parents just spent all the money. It doesn't, you know. I'm sure whatever they got paid, which was probably not very much at all, uh, compared to you know the other stars of the movie. Um, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Gregory Peck, who was yeah. like, notorious before that time. Yeah, all I can remember is uh, like because his voice was 
like I know that they would do I don't know if it was like old Looney Tunes cartoons, but they would reference like celebrities mm-hmm. and, stuff. and I can always like it's, a, it's like a perfect imitation of Gregory Peck, like in some of those cartoons. And I'm like, it's like spot on. And like, I don't know if I've ever seen him in anything else, honestly. I remember seeing him in this was like years ago uh, to kill a mockingbird. OK, he was like the main guy in to kill a mockingbird. And when I was looking him up of other things that he did, uh, he was in the original Cape Fear for De Niro. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah, we actually we did that for Black and White Fright. Oh, nice. And I, I want to say because he there's a lot of scenes where he doesn't wear a shirt and we're making fun of the fact that his pants were up around his tits. That's what we were saying, like the whole episode, because it was like back with the barrel chested dudes were like, yeah. you know, like it, it was really good, by the way. That, that movie is really good. I've never seen um, the original. I've only seen the De Niro cut. Yeah. And um, and somewhat the movie Fear with uh, Mark Wahlberg is also very similar to, to Cape Fear. Not as good, obviously, mm-hmm. but a uh, uh, very similar premise. And I'm, I'm assuming they use fear as part of like homage to that. But but yeah, the original Cape Fear, I would recommend checking out. It, oh, nice. uh, I like I like the uh, the the remake as well. But yeah, the original, it's they're they're both really good for their own their own thing. We can talk about just how cursed this whole film was. Like you know, not only did John Richardson get into that horrible car crash, but uh, right uh, a couple of days right before shooting, Gregory Peck's son committed suicide like two or three days prior to them starting to shoot this movie. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then there was two different planes of different cast members that were both struck by lightning at two different times. And they also had uh, one of the Rottweiler scenes. They The animal, the dogs just bit through all of the protective gear. So, yeah, it's considered like one of the most... Uh, really? Like a like cursed, cursed films, films like yeah. yeah, like one of the. I'm out of that loop completely. Jeez, I didn't know any of this stuff. We we're looking it all up. I mean, because like I know we've always um, I mean, we've always talked about like Poltergeist being like the most like the yeah. movie, and I never even thought about what other movies would be cursed. So when I we were looking at research for for uh, the Omen and just trying to find out some backstories, this mm-hmm. all this information came up and um. Well, that, and uh, there's that show on Shutter. Uh, yeah, called Cursed, Cursed Films, Films, where yeah. they talk about it. There's a whole episode dedicated to The yeah. Omen. Really? Yeah. I, must have, I must have not watched the whole season. I think something. it was a, they did a second season. I think it was in season Oh, two. maybe that's what it was. Maybe I haven't watched that. For as much as I'm on Shutter, you would think that I would do that. But I just watch old Italian horror with subtitles and then old Japanese horror with subtitles and just get weirded out because I'm like, it's so strange. But I don't know. It's uh, It's good, though. Yeah, with the, of, with the amount of times that we talk about Shutter on this show so far, like Shutter sponsor us. Oh my God! Yeah, they the uh, I talk about it a lot. I'm wearing a Shutter shirt right now. I know you probably can't. Oh yeah, tell. I have the same one. I have yeah. the same one. The yeah, the, the, the Black, Black Lives Matter one. Yeah, yeah I loved it. Yep. <laughs> Send it as soon as it's out. I'm like, yep, I'm buying that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I love it. I, I've actually reached out to them. I, I was just like, I don't want any money, but. For the amount that we talk about it, if we can maybe offer like a coupon code to people where they can maybe get an extended trial or something like that. Oh yeah. And then they'll be like, oh yeah, let's uh, we'll talk. And then I never never heard from them again. But uh, you know, at least I tried. They're, it's AMC. So yeah. they got they got bigger deals going on, you know. That's right. I, and I like I thought like there was something happening. They started following us on Twitter like years ago. I was like, oh sweet, like Shutter follows us. Maybe they're watching. They ain't watching. It's fine. I get yeah. it. <laughs> it's cool yeah (laughs) uh one of the other little fun facts that uh feel notable to drop about the omen as a whole is that it did go through multiple uh name changes before it was actually called the omen it started off as a movie called antichrist then it turned to the birthmark and then they finally landed on the omen so i had a couple a couple different name changes before finally landing on one that was, I guess, more effective. I think, yeah, I think that was the better choice. Like mm-hmm. Antichrist, I don't, I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, th- does this say anything about like any kind of backlash? Like, because you know, like you know, the Exorcist and stuff like that, they got a lot of like religious backlash and stuff like that. Was there anything like that with this one? Not that I saw. I mean, I was definitely finding some information about um, some of their. I have to see if I can find it again. Some of the phrases that they were using when promoting the movie, but. They didn't. Ex- I didn't see why they changed the name. They just said that they did. Um, 
Oh, there it wasn't one of the phrases like one day closer to the end of the world or something yeah. like that. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. that. You can say that about every day, right? It was, yeah. it was it was like three different ones. I'm like, yep, that's that fits. But then it's again like what we were saying, like trying to find how that fits in that moment in time and how people would respond to it. I have to find oh, yeah, like, I like, to find it right now. Like taglines, I think, were especially important for these types of movies. But like, horror in general, taglines are so important. And then realizing like it always made me think of like goosebump titles because i feel like a title of a goosebump book was like a tagline for a movie from like the 1930s like say cheese and die mm-hmm. you know, things like that yeah and the one thing too is like i guess 76 and you know around that time was probably i mean it was probably like a big deal that gregory peck was was in a horror movie uh oh yeah you know because it's it was still kind of a at that time i think it was still kind of like one of those things like you're doing horror movies whatever like yeah he did say like when i when i was reading up on it that he felt like this was at a point of his career where it was starting to decline oh like this was kind of like like he hit his peak and then it's like okay i'm now doing this because you know it was such bad juju to do horror movies back in the day yeah little did they know yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Well, I mean, some of the shit they brought on to themselves, like the bamboo scene, like the, the baboon scenes, I mean. Yeah. Um, so we were, I was reading about like how they set it up and how they basically starved the baboons the night before so they would be more aggressive the next day. And then they put meat inside of the car and around the car. And then they kept multiple of the baby baboons in the car so they thought the adults would get mad that their babies were kept from them. I was like, yeah, that must have been a brilliant idea. Nothing, yeah. nothing could go wrong there. It's genius. Uh, so yeah. um, so the mom screaming is, is her literally screaming because it got out of hand. And so I'm like, okay, so some things when we say it's the most cursed movie, some things were freak yeah. accidents, like the lightning on the plane. And then some of we kind of should have seen this yeah. coming with the, the curse was the person and... that made that decision yeah. to be part of the movie. That was the yeah. curse. They yeah. think like, let's just starve the animals. That'll get a better reaction. Like again, yeah. things that would only happen in 1976 versus today. It and it, I mean, it was filmed in the UK too, so I'm sure they maybe had different rules. Uh, oh yeah, and yeah. also the weird thing. So he was ambassador. That's what he was. He was an ambassador okay. in the UK. How can you be an ambassador in the UK when you are so American? Well, he was an aba- he was an American ambassador. Very oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought he was yeah. like like you know like if you go to a, a another country and you get in trouble, they they they'll bring you to the uh, uh, like, yeah the ambassador because they're they had to represent. The people from your country kind of deal okay um, yeah my brain went to a significantly higher title oh yeah, yeah wait a minute yeah, you're they were talking about him running for president soon and it's just like yeah. that's a big jump <laughs> you know like something is quite yeah. off with your line yeah. of work sir yeah the wrong yeah, country a pretty uh pretty awesome house for being an ambassador too like how much oh, does yeah. make? everything about that was was awesome like every every shot in this movie is gorgeous it was, it was yeah. shot in panavision it's so soft and muted it, everything to look at in this in this film is so nice yeah there was even like uh there was shots where like earlier in the movie too where he was sitting in a hallway and it was like a really close-up shot of like the side of his face but it was still it gave you enough room where you could see all the way down the hallway like but with the the, the nice bokeh and everything like that it just was very artistically done you know it just looked really good yeah, they they really planned out those shots because even with even with the hanging scene, like I I wonder if like if they planned for her body to shoot back, mm. or did that happen on accident and they had to like reset up for the camera behind her to get that scope mm. of like oh if if we're seeing it go in like we need that close up and the glass shattering almost hitting this poor woman, like I wonder if that was planned or they shot the watch excuse me, they shot that wide. And I was like, oh shit, she flew in. We got to, we got to run up and, and prep for another That's shot. An amazing happy accident. I'm like, oh shit, that's awesome. Let's keep going. Like we thought she was just going to go in there and knock this lady out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I kind of want to see that blooper of like, she just goes in and swings too hard and knocks her over. Like, I want to see the blooper yeah. where the rope breaks. Yeah. They just throw it and she just continues yeah. the fall. The blooper is all the glass just like flies out of the window and like kids just are running for their lives. Yeah. Like, <laughs> But then you always love the fact of like just watching the clown in the background. Oh yeah, the, the clown the, random the clown. clown always stood out to me in this in this scene for some weird reason. Because oh. like 
there's a split right, second. The clown always stands out. Like it's yeah. it's great. There, there's a split second of the clown, like when it, it has that close up of the clown, and it's like he's like looking over his shoulder, and like every time I look at him, I was like, this dude gives zero fucks that this lady just like killed herself. He's just like, I mean, he's a birthday clown. He's just like looking, and like I'm just waiting for like <laughs> the cigarette to like come up yeah. and the take and drag. Yeah, it, <laughs> it it reminds me, even though it's totally not the same kind of movie at all, but like that clown that falls over and dies uh, in Billy Madison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, that, that's a clown that I always think of whenever I see just a random shot of a clown. I'm like, I just think of that dude who's just sitting there and blood's dripping out of his mouth. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm an adult. So to, to wrap, to wrap things up for today, again, I want to thank you for, for being our guest here and, in, in our, yeah, I want to thank you for being our guest on kill the week here. So uh, before we before we get going, where can people follow you and things like that? I'm um, just uh, I pretty much it's only on uh, Instagram. It's just a knuckle on Instagram. That's a it's an old nickname from my band days. Uh, and uh, black and white frights on everywhere. It's an audio podcast everywhere you can find uh, audio podcasts. Uh, Wicked Horror Show is on YouTube and Facebook live Tuesday nights and then uh the week after the audio goes up for a regular audio podcast. Um that strange show, uh it's kind of we take little hiatuses here and there, but same deal everywhere you can find podcasts. And um uh the reeducation of Nancy Ann Ritter is going to be both video and audio and just be on the lookout for that in uh September. Don't know the exact date yet, but uh that's what we're shooting for. And uh, other than that, um you know I'm just you know, watching British television or Shudder. That's all I'm doing. Awesome. And thank you guys for having me on too, by the way. Of course, of course. We we want to, you know, bring as many people that we enjoy talking to and having fun with into this weird new adventure that we're having because this is our first time putting together like a web show podcast and just want to have some fun with it and talk with good people who know their shit. Nice. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. So thank you again. And you can follow all of our stuff at Dirk's Productions on literally everything, or you can follow my personal Instagram at Falcone665, I think it is. I don't know. I think that's what I am. And what about you? Um, in addition to making the horror movies, I also run a bakery. It's 8213 Desserts. Oh. And you can follow everyone there and get caught up on everything that we have going on. So thank you, and we'll catch you guys next week for a new episode of Kill of the Week. Every two weeks. Every two weeks.